I'm always amazed by the amount of people that just show up into your life when you step into your highest calling. Uh, when I say highest calling, I mean just following your heart and doing what you love. And in this podcast episode, I've got a, one of these people who just basically just showed up into my life and I was captivated by the work that she'd done and the, and the her experience so far that I wanted to bring her onto the show and share some of her wisdom with you guys and uh, and this person, her name is Joa Rivers and Joa uh, walked into the Soul 7 clinic uh, one day when I was working and I'd known her for a couple of weeks and almost felt like I'd known her for a lifetime uh, when we sat down and did the interview. Uh, so just a bit of background about Joa. Joa is, um, she's a posture specialist and a personal trainer uh, and basically Joa was diagnosed with scoliosis when she was 15 years old and this kind of took her down this path of trying to find her uh, optimal health uh, for herself through through healing her spine. Um, but this has also led her to become a personal trainer. Uh, and she works with individuals ranging from absolute beginners to experienced athletes who, who have an agenda. So she does lots of group sessions, uh, one-on-one kind of stuff. But it, it was more the mindset aspect as well that, that was so unique about Joa. She incorporated the physical component so well, but also the mental component. So she had the full mind, body, spirit uh, in her work. And she has some amazing stories and traveled all over the world. So I'm excited to share this episode with you all. Enjoy. Welcome to the State Shifters Podcast. Joe Rivers, welcome to the State Shifters Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And we met only last week. Yes. Uh, you walked into the Soul Seven Clinic. Our mutual friend Bob Berman. Uh, you got you were one of the first clients from Soul Seven. Yes, 2013. Yeah. 2013. For people who don't know, I work at Soul Seven, which is a uh, frequency clinic here in Yorkville, Toronto, and we are sitting outside in the beautiful University of Toronto Gardens, and we're going to have a chat because we connected and we realised that we have a lot in common and that our paths are. Uh, we're trying to promote a similar message through the work that we do. And I was inspired by your story. I'm inspired by the journey that you have taken so far. Do you mind giving people a little bit of a background about your journey? Because you've only just got back to Toronto. You've been traveling around the world. How did this all start? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for inviting me here in my hometown, I would say, because um, it's been... Uh, journey that I started uh, in Venezuela, that I, I'm actually from Venezuela, and I was so blessed that um, the universe opened the doors of Canada after so many years uh, traveling, and I became a Canadian about eight years ago, so basically this is home for me, um, like a hometown, even though like I feel like I have traveled so much that home is where you feel... Um, at peace, right? So you could feel at peace anywhere. Uh, but Toronto is definitely some type of um, of uh, a special place that I always feel connected to great relationships and to where I started to build my uh, awakening process. And that's how I went to Soul 7 in 2013. And I met uh, Bob, uh, who is an amazing uh, influencer in my life and also in the community of um, consciousness and creating this um, uh, this open vortex to anybody to explore their own emotions and their own um, limitations and fears and to let them go in the past and then to ex- start a new uh, path of uh, freedom, let's say, if that's a good way to explain. Now that you're asking me about my background, Beside Toronto, I have been traveling um, before Toronto. I actually live in the States, and I spent three years in the States. That was my first experience after Venezuela when I was 19. I Where decided, in the States was this? Uh-huh. I Where live in California, in California, and then I live in Chicago for about three years there. And it was a great experience for me to start. It was uh, very difficult for me because I didn't speak any English. Uh, as you know, my accent is uh, that Latin accent. Um, it's been a nice journey in terms of like learning from cultures. So after spending three years in the States, I uh, 
uh, I looked into another place to visit and to stay. And Toronto was that land that opened the doors uh, for me to expand myself. And I became a Canadian in 2012, I believe, or 11. And that really opened up the doors for me to explore the world in a bigger level. So I went to Australia in mm -hmm. 2013. I did uh, a big transformation uh, in my journey. And I decided to put on the side my, my business that I was running and everything was running well, but I needed to take a break from, from, from my routine. I needed to just um, separate myself from uh, the day-to-day, -day, how can I say, like... Um, Grind. Yeah, it was more like a routine that I yeah. wasn't able to see beyond the the actions that I was doing. I wasn't being grounded. I wasn't being filled uh, and fulfill my desires. So uh, something I was missing something definitely. And uh, I was turning 30, so it was like a big um, a big moment in my life that I, I was kind of I was feeling I was becoming an adult. Mm. So I say before anything happens, I, I want to go to Australia because I think Australia is one place that I always had in my mind. Uh, when I was 15, my dad gave me a book. And, um, and this book was called The Voice of the Desert, uh, The Voices of the Desert um, by Marlon Morgan. And the book is about this journalist that goes to Australia. It has a lot of controversies, this book, because a lot of people said that she kind of like... Um, there is a good and a bad things about the book, but I try to take the best of the book, which was the experience of being away from the from the from the non, walking on a place that so far from this uh, journalist, she was from the states. She goes to Australia and she gets to experience life with Aboriginals there, and I love the experience, even though it has the good and the bad uh, uh, support. I, I took the best out of it, and I say, oh, maybe. I could also experience something similar if I just take a break from my routine and I travel so many miles away from my normal life, I could maybe I start exploring parts of my life myself that I haven't been able to do because the distractions that I have in the city. So I did it and I spent one year in Sydney. It wasn't an easy, um, an easy transition. It took a lot of... Um, steps and and it was very difficult to to leave home and, and go it's, it was like a huge uh, it was crazy because people it's like you live in your business you go in there and, and for you don't even know what it is but i had this desire internal like an inner voice that was telling me to do it i definitely cannot regret for the for what i did um i had a great experience in sydney so you are from sydney no i'm from perth from Perth, um, out okay. west. So I was yeah. in the other coast. Um, I got uh, connected to the nature. That was my main intention, was to be connected to the water. Um, in intentionally, I wanted to be close to the water. So I live on Manly Beach in front of the water. It's a surf town. Um, I was walking bare feet every day. So I was practicing everything. Uh, I forgot about shoes because I wasn't needed. I just walked to the beach and meditate there. I took a program of Deepak Chopra. So it was very good, uh, and uh, I learned this um, program that was about synchro destiny. I really loved it. It was about opening, um, opening yourself to explore and to see uh, sometimes coincidences that happen in your life and signs that can uh, make your life um, with more sense. And then like track the steps and track the points and make sure that you kind of like very in tune and very present with each step. And I, I noticed a change in my behavior and on my actions. Um, after the year in Australia, I moved to Singapore and I lived there for two years as a health coach and I had a, a time where I could transform people physically. It was a great experience to be there with um, great coaches around the world. I learned, I educate uh, the Singaporeans and I also educate myself with all um, the interaction with everybody there. Um, so it was a great experience. And then I got again the inner call to leave Singapore and to come back home. And basically that's why I'm here now. So your work before you left, what was that? You, you're working as a personal trainer yeah. back home. So I being um, a yoga teacher since 2000 and I would say about eight, a yoga teacher, right? 
And I started becoming uh, very interested in more um, areas of fitness and wellness. So I study uh, nutrition programs, I did training programs, and, uh, and I just noticed the more you study, the less I knew, and the more I needed to know, like the, the more I study, the less I know. So it's like, wow, this is a very um, expanding uh, field, and I'm still learning. It's a constant learning every day. Mm -hmm. um, so I oriented my practice to my skills. Uh, I, I have a bachelor in education, mm -hmm. so I am a teacher. I love educating. Since I'm a kid, I am always want to be the teacher. And uh, I love that, um, uh, that part of myself, that I have that desire of teaching and never keeping secrets of what I know. I like to share what I know, things that have worked on myself or with my clients. I always share it with no... no no, nothing to be hiding in my world. Um, so basically, I oriented my skills into doing things that are uh, meaningful for others. So I became a health coach out of the years and putting together all these little pieces of studies and practice that I have. So into the, when before I left Australia, I already have my business, which is Joa Fitness, which basically I was offering services of... Um, of two individuals and two groups about being healthy, so optimizing their health either by finding a nutrition plan that it fits their life or um, trying to, to improve their digestions and understanding what food goes well or not. And then I also um, continue practicing the, the yoga part, which is a big part of my practice, which yoga is not just the yoga of movement. Yoga for me... I started in, when I was 15 with the book that my dad gave me about yoga, but it's more about the whole philosophy of life, which is like there is seven elements, and one of them is meditation and devotion. So there is so much, uh, it's much deeper than the asanas. Like most of the people know in the Western part, the asanas, but there is much deeper, like meditation is much important than moving. So if your brain cannot be focused you cannot move your body. So I actually, I was lucky enough that I started doing yoga from books. So I didn't even know how to move. I could see the people moving in the pictures, but I never had to experience after eight, four years. So I knew more about the philosophy mm. than, um, than the movement. The wow. movement came after, and I understood how complex it could be and how, how, um, how deep it can be the practice. Um, yeah, that's pretty much. Yeah, I, the one thing that... I res resonated with, with yeah. you was the through the body you were able to access deeper realms of your consciousness and you tapped into your true nature which yeah we were discussing yesterday it's beyond the body and beyond the mind is is our true essence and when we connect with that we fill ourselves up with this tremendous amount of life energy that we want to go out and share with other people yes um, so at what point for you because I I for me for personally I was big into working out and training my body religiously. Yeah. Um, and it, it wasn't for some time until perhaps when I discovered yoga as well that I started to tap into the, to the, the spiritual side, um, which I gained access through the yeah. body. Mm -hmm. How did this kind of realm open up for you? Well, if I tell you the truth, I think um, I'm always been in tune with myself since I'm a kid. Yeah. I'm always been asking, why am I here? Always, mm. since I'm a kid, I always... My, I always been in that curiosity much deeper of what I can see physically. I was five years old. And I used to ask my, my, my sister, like, why are you my sister? Like, why my parents are my parents? Why do I live in this house? That doesn't make sense for me. So I, sometimes I used to get in this stuff and I couldn't understand. I used to have dreams, very, like, vivid dreams of, of things that were really strong. Like, sometimes I used to dream I used to be a, an army guy that used to get, I used to get, trap and kill over and over. So I was a kid having those dreams I yeah. couldn't understand. Okay. And um, and I had a lot of, uh, especially through dreams, my dad and I, we, we I used to wake up in the morning and tell my dad my dreams. And he used to try to help me to understand what was it because I was just in this world that I was a kid but having experiences that I couldn't understand. And my dad and my mom, they're not spiritual. So for them, it was just not even easy to explain those things to me. And I was just lucky that 
along my, my journey, I could find uh, help and experts to, uh, to explain to me these little things and with my own self-studies. So I think it's something that has started since, since I was created. And I think if it goes the way as I was created, I, always, I think that's very important. I was created with love. My parents disarmed me very bad. Like my mom had two years of treatments to have me. Uh, so I'm coming from a very source of love. My mom and my dad disarmed me for two years. They did treatments. Finally, I was uh, conceived. And then it was very hard uh, pregnancy that I had to born premature. So I was always like so precious for my parents. So I think because I was cultivating, like I was a seed and the seed was cultivated with so much love. I mean, I'm so blessed to be coming from that, um, from that source of love. I think that created a lot of, of who I am now. Definitely who I am now is just a, a, a seed of love that was created from the moment that my parents had the desire to have me. Mm -hmm. So you competed in bodybuilding uh, for five, five years, was it? Um, yeah, so I competed in 2012. I started competing and, uh, and I started with an organization was like the easiest organization to start to practice, to, to get the feeling of being on the stage. Um, I, I'm not sure if I told you the truth after my experience uh, as human, if I did it out of my narcissism or uh, out of my inspiration, I'm not sure. But I know it, I, it took a lot of discipline. It took a lot of uh, habits and a lot of actions to get there. It definitely to be on the stage, it takes a lot of um, commitment. And I learned a lot of good stuff. Um, then down the road after competing 10 times, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if that wasn't, that was the message I wanted to give to people. And unfortunately, there is a lot of, um, you know, like, Ego to ego. Pressure, pressure uh, and, and ego. Yeah. And the social media and all this happening now is very hard on the kids and on the teenagers. So I think after 10 times competing, I think my intention that was to, to show the symmetry of my body and how my body could evolve from being like a skinny girl and having a scoliosis and showing how well I could be feeling and being able to compete in, uh, among other people that didn't have a scoliosis and all this. Uh, that intention kind of like faded away after trying so hard for 10 times. Um, that's why I decided not to compete anymore. Now I'm still, I'm still coaching athletes, which uh, I'm very excited to bring some athletes this year for the competitions this year that I am I'm preparing. But uh, my, my, my journey, I think, is, is complete in terms of mm -hmm. my message because I mm -hmm. try to have every single action with an with a intention. So I think my intention has been fulfilled in that terms. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm trying to, because for people who are, who are listening and viewing this, uh, h how does that transition come about when you go from competing as a bodybuilder to now integrating this holistic approach to your training and your coaching with your clients, how do you then, if someone comes to work with you, do you integrate that in the gym to start off with and then outside of the gym? Well, I think the most important for me as a coach is to understand what the person is approaching to me. They approach to me because they need, um, they're looking for a guidance and I try to listen to exactly their needs, what they actually are looking for. So I set the map from, from where they want to be to where they want, uh, where they are, where, where, to where they want to be. Mm -hmm. So I always make sure that the, the intention is there clear, right? Because it's not about me, it's about them. If they really want it, I will make the route the, 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 the best in, in, within my uh, skills, within my scope of practice, I will try to do the best, but they need to be uh, clear of what they want. So if I have clients, that's the question, right? If they, yes. If I, if I have a client that wants to compete, I always make sure, like, what is your comp like, what do you want to compete for? Mm. If they explain to me, well, I want to compete because I want to have more discipline or, like, be because I, I'm a little mm. bit shy and I think being in front mm. of people will break that um, fear of, like, a public fear, then I understand, I, I, I explain. And then I also explain the whole route of competition because there is a big part of um, understanding that it's not like a um, three months goal, it's like a whole year goal. So like how far do you want to take this serious? Like do you want to go to a pro level or you just looking to just step out on the stage, right? Because you don't want to cause any imbalance on your body. So if you want to go all the way to pro level, I try to visualize the bigger picture. Like look, you're gonna be here on December, 2019. So let's set it up for that day, and also how to integrate that into your life in a real way. That once you stop, your life it won't be um, 
uh, a disaster, right? Mm -hmm. So slowly how to eat healthy, understanding that you can be an athlete, uh, but in a, in a way that you don't have to crash your system. That happened to me at yeah. the beginning. I tried so hard yes. and I give it all out and I, I, nobody told me about what happened after, right? Like what happened after a show? Like how much are you going to eat? Mm. Um, if, you pre if you are uh, planning to, to compete again, um, how would you do it? You know, so I think it's very important, not the ending goal, but understanding the journey and every day, uh, enjoying the everyday journey, understanding that life will continue after that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. How does someone get clear on that end goal? Because I know from the context of the health industry yeah. and the bodybuilding industry in particular, I sometimes think the end goal is, is not thought of enough from people. And I know for me personally, it wasn't until I started questioning why I was going to the gym. Because as a young teenager, I'm, I'm going to the gym to lift weights, to look good. Yeah. To, it, when you start to ask why long enough, you start to get to a point to go, wait a second, there's an underlying uh, fear here. It, for me, it was a fear because okay. it's a fear that if I don't look good, people aren't going to like me. Yeah. I won't be accepted. I won't fit in. Yeah. I won't find love. So how do you get clear for people when to find out what it is they actually want when it comes to working out and life in general? Yeah. Because it's an well, important as question. a health coach, I have online clients where I don't have the access to help them and supervise the training mm. sessions. Mm. Uh, so I usually, uh, in the questionnaires, on the initial questionnaires where I get to know the person, mm. I try to understand where they're coming from, uh, if they have a background in a sport they really enjoy, or if they have, they try to gravitate to a, to a certain discipline that they love, you know. Not everybody wants to be on the gym indoors. Yeah. Um, not everybody wants to be ar um, around other people. Some people want, just want to be moving their bodies alone. So I kind of understand that, and I try to be very... Um, I try to listen a lot to what they are looking for and setting up uh, um, a, pr a program that will suit uh, their personality and their goals and the results will come. So I think it, it, I don't obligate anybody to come to the gym There's because I am pretty holistic. Mm. And then I always tell them, if you, want, if you want yoga, yoga can take you in a path that you can get fit if you, if you want to be doing Pilates it also. If you want to practice Tai Chi, if you actually don't want to exercise, you just want to walk on this on the beautiful beach, then you you do it. You know, mm -hmm. so it depends on what they really want. And then, in terms of uh, training, I definitely suggest the woman after 30 to train because the only way for us to stimulate muscle is by creating some resistance. And I always. Um, remind my clients I'm 33 mm. years old and I definitely can feel like the, the the more muscle I carry the healthier I am and it's a way to rejuvenate your body so when we start losing muscle we're putting ourselves in an aging yes. stage so it's very important to keep muscle I'm not asking to be a bodybuilder or like to eat uh, so much protein and collapse your kidneys <laughs> but I'm definitely suggesting to people to lift some certain type of weights because it's how our body uh, can be stimulating and preserving the muscle will preserve your jaw. So I think everybody would get benefits from keeping the muscle. And it doesn't have to be an hour. I always say you always have 20 minutes. 20 minutes is just enough to stimulate your body every day. You don't need to do so much. So as long as you enjoy it, you play your best tunes and you exercise and the way as you love it, then it's fine. Yeah, and, and then that cut th cuts through the ego element straight away. When you're training yeah. to feel good, not just to look good, of that's, course, that's yeah. the, the fundamental shift that happened for me. And that's a great point. People take note. If you start to get over 30, all the more reason to keep training. Yes. Because uh, I'm still quite young. I'm not 30 yet. I'm 24. But it, even just now, when I go and lift weights, yeah. there's something about the way it makes me feel. The um, hormones yeah, release. It's, yeah. and it's, you, you can't compare that with anything else so it, can, it doesn't even have to be for the look i think the look's just the byproduct of well yeah i mean when you're happy uh with yourself mm. eventually you just will show that your eyes will show through you know you don't mm -hmm. have to be hiding your eyes will be showing who you are your smile is going to be a uh, genuine smile and we all have beauty we all have beauty we all like made out of the same you know so um, as long as you cultivate that love inside, eventually you're, you will start glowing on the outside without, you know, just effortlessly. So I think um, less pressure in 
how you look and more into what are you feeling is more important. The feeling will actually release the beauty on you. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. So the phys we've covered the physical component now. So for people who are listening who may not necessarily have their own physical exercise regime in place already, you said for women especially to start exercising. Where what if what if people are a little bit afraid of going to the gym? Can they can they uh, incorporate a physical exercise routine without going to the gym? For sure. Yeah. I mean, like I was just telling before, there are so many ways to move the body. Uh, lately, there is a lot of studies that shows that uh, it just it takes certain amount of time and commitment for you. So functional movements, which is actually movements that we do on a daily basis, like a squatting, lunches, we do it all the time to pick up ob objects, to carry our groceries from, mm. from, from our uh, market. So it's so useful to be able to feel uh, strong and not depending on anybody or a nurse in the future. So uh, you don't need a gym. Uh, gyms are getting so popular and sometimes they don't even pay attention on you so you don't a gym is a great way because uh, some people really feel stimulated by being around other people uh, working out you always can bring and have a tribe a community there which mm -hmm. is nice mm -hmm. look at all these uh, <laughs> flies and things um so but there is so much it depends where you live like those people that live in a hot uh, places like weather that uh, that allows you to be with the nature i think that will be the most uh, uh, natural way, of course, to be is just exercising outdoors. You don't need mo more than your own body. If you want to add some elastic bands and some, like, if you want to do TRX, if you like that, or it's so easy to incorporate equipment that doesn't require big uh, amount of, uh, you know, like machines that to bring. But um, I think the most important is to to train your mind. So when you train your mind with meditation, with like visualizations, with like understanding who you are, then like training your body is like the easiest thing ever. Training the body comes naturally because it's how we're supposed to do, we're supposed to move, you know, so. Yeah, well said, Joe. And this is one thing that I realized recently with the gym is you can turn the you know, to work out into a meditation mm. uh, through, because this has been, Arnold Schwarzenegger said this, he said uh, when he's in the gym, his attention goes into the muscle that he's working. His full focus and attention goes into that area. And there's been proven scientific studies now to show that when just through the act of focusing your attention on the muscle group that you're working, yeah. you can boost your muscle size by like muscle strength by like 15% or something like that. Totally. So when you're in the gym, treat that as mind training as well. Like for me, it was just like focusing on what area of the body's being worked right now and then putting my attention there, just like Arnold did. And through the act of doing that, I'm training my mind to hold my attention on the body. Yeah. And that's what meditation is. It's totally. It's bringing your attention within, into the body. Yeah, so, totally. There, there is a big connection between our thoughts and the muscle. They actually uh, study that says when you train, looking at the mirror and your muscle, because you're yeah. so focused on that So muscle, the mirror does have a purpose. It gets bigger. It's not just to admire our muscles. Yeah, that you yeah. don't see. So... <laughs> Yeah, but then it's also important to listen to your body when it tells you, hey, are you overtraining? That's very important. Are you overtraining and having some respect to your bodies? Because mm. if you don't respect your body, eventually it's going to break. And when it breaks, it most likely it's going to stop you training for a long time, which I happened to me before when um, I punish myself by training hard. You know, like uh, there is a lot of things in my mind and I don't know how to cope with it. And then I just go to a gym to release the tension yeah. and I'm actually... Uh, punishing my body so there is a big connection on respecting the body limitations and uh, before it breaks right it, when it breaks it, it could take you a long time like there is a point in my life that I got so many injuries all over my body I needed to stop training for one year it was so hard mentally not to train it was like a mental mm -hmm. injury um, to understand but in that year after so like I was like a little horse so like trying so hard <laughs> to train and I stopped it totally. I understood that um, you really need to listen to your body and not abuse your body. Like sometimes we abuse of our bodies. And uh, and that year it took me in a journey of meditation. So I realized when you meditate uh, without, you just meditate, you concentrate on meditation without exercising for one year, 
Uh, you actually can you go did deeper. That? Yeah. But one year you, yeah. so you didn't exercise. Yes, I, ha- I was forced wow. to do it. I yeah. lost like seven kilos. Everybody's like, wow, what happened to you? <laughs> I was forced not to train. My body forced me. Like I couldn't move my arms. I had like a, a cervical problem that um, I had pin and needles on my left arm. I had tendonitis on my right arm. I have like I tore my my triangle over here on my on my wrist, and then my legs were also like having some issues with my hip. So I couldn't move anything, and I realized that I needed to stop. And within my meditations, my body told me, "Look, I gave you so much. You know, you're taking me." Uh, since you're born, you just take me, and you don't respect me, and you you abuse me to a point that now you can do anything. Now you gotta meditate. Yeah. So I put all my intention to meditation, and I understood a lot of things came to me because I wasn't focusing on training. So I've been following a lot of monks, and they say the monks that go to monasteries, they always tell people that bec- they are so far away from from families, from money, from everything. They just give all their time to meditate. So in that mindset, um, the meditation is fully, fully given to mm-hmm. to that. So definitely, it makes a difference. It happened to me for a year, and I'm happily back to train with respect, and I understand what I have to stop. So I'm a little bit more present, and uh, it was a great uh, uh, opportunity to to dive into meditation for real. So what does your meditation practice consist of now? Because I love meditation and yeah. it wasn't until I started training the mind just as much as I was training my body, which is when I started to notice um, my connection with the spirit. And, yeah. and, and, it's, and it's holistic. And, and meditation is such a massive component for me. Uh, whether it's necessary for everyone, that depends on the person. Uh, but how does, it, how does your practice, how yeah. is it involved and what does it consist of now? Um, well, meditation. I started teaching meditation as part of my yoga classes. It was like 10 minutes of at the end of the class uh, of meditation. So I had to study how to become a meditation teacher. Um, I used to get so deep into it. I started in 2008. So I've been teaching meditation for 10 years. But I, I never really got into the meditation, I guess, because I, I was always in, in a city with so much stress. I practiced and all, but I think I never really, really, really fell in, in tune with it until I went to, to India and I went to practice on ashrams. So I guess just because the ashrams have so much sacred energy, like so many people go, come with the intention of releasing and being present and feeling all this compassion with no identification. Um, I felt a lot of uh, changes in terms of my meditation practice. So I now practice a meditation that is based on, uh, it's called yoga meditation. I am very hyper. Uh, personal, my personality, um, it comes with a lot of energy. Um, it's something that is my, my essence, you know. I, I, I can understand it. I don't want to control it. I just want to understand it. And uh, and see what serves me and not. If I'm too hyper, uh, if I'm hurting myself somehow, I try to step away and then try to help that person that is hurting. So in this moment, my meditation is tuning with my energy because I have so much energy. In this moment, I think every uh, stage of our life could take you to different meditation practices. But in this moment, I feel identified with this meditation that uh, since the moment I practice, I felt like... Um, I, I felt uh, grounded, and it's a meditation that lasts between 25 minutes and 30 minutes. And it's done um, uh, four hours before eating, so you, the recommendation is not to have any anything in your stomach, yeah. just liquid. Um, and it's based on different breathing techniques. So there is like seven stages of breathing on this meditation. So because I'm so active, I'm hyper, uh, the, the breathing kind of like... It, it, it keeps me in the moment. It's really tough to be meditating and thinking on nothing. That's like super, super hard because once you close your eyes, your mind, it has like 50,000 thoughts in the moment. So it's so difficult to just think about breathing. It's just the more you breathe, the deeper you can connect to the meditation. So I really like this meditation that changes the breathing techniques like from one nostril to another nostril fire breathing, there's so many type of breathings. Plus, it also integrates some movements with my body. So I like to like mobility on the wrist and certain things. So this meditation, I learned it in India. 
I practice it since uh, last year. I've been doing it like every day. I'm I'm open to do it two times a day if I have the time. Uh, if not, I do it once a day. And and basically, it has also some chanting, so it includes chanting and breathing and yoga. Yeah, I beautiful. like this one. Yeah, beautiful, and that's that's the the best thing to do is to experiment with different forms of meditation because there's no one size fits all and yeah. bre- breathing is, is a, a certain way of connecting deeper with the body and yeah the fact that you've integrated different forms like that it, it's cool um, mm-hmm. so again try meditation try different forms find the one that works best for you so i want to because i want to touch on travel for a minute because traveling is something that has really helped me and opened up my perspective and seen um, it's allowed me to step into the unknown and practice being okay with not knowing yeah. um, how my life is going to unfold. Uh, and I truly believe travel is one way of practicing that. You have traveled far and wide. You've been to India, you've been to Australia, Singapore, all over Canada, born in Venezuela. How has travel, travel helped you connect with your soul? And, and what would you say is the biggest lesson you've learned while traveling mm, or through yeah. traveling? I don't know how to explain because the traveling part has been a desire since I'm a little kid of leaving home. I have no idea why. Um, I left home when I was 19. I wanted to leave home when I was 15, but my dad didn't allow me. He's like, you need to have a career before you leave home because if anything happens, you need to cover your things, right? So it's like, okay. Like all parents. I push all what I could do. By 19, I already had my degree. I had a bachelor's degree in education in uh, computers so i took my degree and i left home with 300 dollars and no support of my family because in venezuela the markets are closed like the financial markets you cannot send money out of the country so since 19 i've been supporting myself my journey being responsible of my actions um traveling for me um it just takes me out of the familiar uh, environment so like out of my comfort zone uh, so it pushes me to to develop skills um, that I don't see when I have everything easy to get uh, it connects me to cultures and people so I usually when I travel I like to get to the kitchen of people remotely far like when I went to Vietnam I went to this a small town it was about four hours away from a, a small village these people were living there like mm-hmm. in a they had two houses and the next village was like three hours later like away so it's like so far from each other so that was such a grounding experience where you get to see these people they have no tv they're just there living life the most natural way the kids have no playstation or any fancy technology and they're still developing their their skills you know so they do hand crafting and, and they are just the same like us it's just with less materialism you know so yes. I, I like that I like to connect to the real and raw life you know that's what I usually like when I travel I don't I'm not the tip, the person that goes into fancy places I'm, I'm more into the the raw and the real life of other people the same when i go to india i love to go into like little kitchen of people that i just meet and like show me how you cook i love cooking so i love that uh, to experience the food and cook with people and traditional cooking in where they live i love that as well and um, traveling i experienced like the biggest one i i think when i went to uluru when i went to ayers rock it was very beautiful experience because it was so remotely far from the world. And I had that dream when I was 15. It took me 15 years to get there. Uh, I think that's something that I always will remember. Uh, and it was very full of energy and sacred um, sacred vibration, that very hard to explain. The only way to know is to be there. Um, I think that will be uh, one of the memories that I will, keep, I will keep with me and I will tell my grandkids to, about, about what I have done. But I think everywhere where I go, it's always an experience. I love every place that I have visited. Uh, there are certain places that have caused uh, a, a little bit of um, an awareness. Like when I went to Cambodia, yep. it was very tough because um, I i mean, in Venezuela, there's a lot of kids on the street. But in Cambodia, it's a little bit over what I was thinking that was happening. There is a lot of abuse. 
uh, child abuse. Um, and it's very difficult to see this with your eyes. Like you cannot have a normal dinner when their kids asking for for food, and then you can see older people taking them to hotels, and you cannot do anything about it. Mm. This is actually happening now. Mm. So I just stayed two days in Cambodia. I couldn't take it. I couldn't see this happening in front of my eyes. Um, the kids are just commercialized there. There's not much I can do. They have nobody to protect them. They're just there. And it was just so hard for me to see, uh, and I couldn't do much there. So if I ever go back to Cambodia, it will be with a foundation, something that I will just contribute for the community. It's just very tough. I think that's one of the toughest situations I've been around. Um, and the rest is, is being just um, exploring uh, landscapes and loving every every culture. So that's pretty much. Yeah, you know. beautiful. I think yeah, traveling can just has so much benefits to offer, uh, both from a from a mind, yeah. body, and soul perspective. What advice would you have for someone who's thinking about traveling and exploring, but they're not sure where to go or whether they're, they're a little scared to take that leap and and leave a job or leave home? Yeah. Uh, for traveling, I think anybody can do the traveling uh, as long as they they have an intention. And uh, I go with the flow, you know. I have certain schedule, like I want to visit certain places. Um, but I just go with the flow um, with not much expectations. I'm not uh, telling people... Uh, to serve me in a way I respect it. When I went to China, it was a little bit of a shock as well. But I'm nobody to judge the culture. Yeah. That's how they live, you know. And it just teaches me how different we are sometimes and how blessed and how I, I could appreciate more my culture, where I'm coming from, where we have so much equality and we have so much acceptance to each other. And like in Canada, we have such a freedom that not everybody has the, those rights, you know. So it just gives me that um, contrast, but it doesn't give me any voice to be joshing or pointing fingers. Yeah. So that's what I learned. Like when I'm in certain places, you're like, wow, like what is this? But it, I don't have to, I'm there. I'm actually so blessed that they opened the doors for me to see that, but I'm nobody to josh it. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that I've been always trying to, to learn. And... Um, my experience is always just to enjoy every single day of my traveling. And the pictures times, it's funny because at the beginning when you travel, if you're not a traveler and you just start traveling and you want to take a picture of everything, yeah, I was like then your phone and your cameras <laughs> get full of pictures. Yeah. So I realized that I'm trying to be in the moment. I take yeah. one or two pictures of things that I really find, yeah. like it would be nice to blog it or to keep it with me, but I try not to do selfies on every single part, or like <laughs> pictures of every single, like I can find a picture like that just on, on the book yeah. or like on the website or, so I try to be more in the moment and, and forget about like the, the, the pictures and things like this. I think I try to just value that I'm actually there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I think you bring up a really great point about being in the moment and I know presence and present moment awareness has been a big part of your life. Yeah. And it's such a great, massive part of my life uh, because I read Eckhart Tolle's book. Yeah, New Earth, amazing. And it completely changed my view on the world. And I realized that all the answers that I ever wanted are available in the present moment. You of just course. have to learn to be still and silent and listen. And through the present moment, you're actually guided by an intelligence far deeper than what our minds can comprehend. And I th for me it was a practice over time that unconditioning my mind to thinking about the past worrying about worrying about the past thinking about the future and training my mind to be more connected with the present moment which means it doesn't need to think all the time so I know you've incorporated that kind of way of living as well and how do how does someone start to live in the present moment because it gets it's a word that gets thrown around a lot um, but living it is another thing yeah, well, living in the present moment is being such a um, uh, cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> New AG. Yeah, everybody's word, yeah. like being the now, being the present, but not everybody lived that life. And I think I started lately um, from my own awareness of um, how I was running my life. I was always in a race looking. Uh, to be married at a certain age. I was looking to have kids at a certain age. I had this preconception uh, 
thoughts about how my life had to be because the traditions of my country and my family, then a lot of things didn't go the way as I wanted. You know, so all my expectations uh, were not uh, fulfilled. Then I, I crashed, you know, I crashed, I hit the bottom. And it took me a lot of years to reconstruct my thoughts. So I was willing to, to, to do it, to, very important, right? Because people can tell you, but you have to have this desire to do it. So it took me, I would say the last five years of being um, married myself and putting a lot of effort myself um, with self studies and hiding experts of understanding what was happening to my brain that I wasn't being uh, present, I wasn't being um, um, enjoying my now. I was always looking to uh, what was next. So I was, gra I was grasping something, I wanted to go for the next, I wanted to go for the next. So I'm now always remind myself to be in the now. There is an amazing book by um, Eckhart Tolle, uh, that is the power of now. Like if you haven't read it, I recommend you 100% to, yes, me to too. take it. It's read so simple book. to read, even a, if even a kid, a children, the children can understand that, it's so easy. Um, and you can read it on any page. You just take the book, open the book, and any page will mm -hmm. talk to you. You don't need to go from the beginning to the end. Um, so being in the present, it's just, it takes time. I mean, I cannot explain to you until you're actually ready to do, but the very first key of being in the present is to breathe. Yes. Breathing is the most important. Uh, a lot of people live on a shallow breath. Um, suffocating their lungs, uh, not being aware of, of that. Because the breath is the first thing that comes into your body when you're born. And this is the last thing that comes when we die. When we die as a process of living as well. Like death is just life in another level. So, but physically, right, it will happen and we have to be ready for that moment. And I think if you breathe uh, con with, with conscious, then that's when the present will come. Anytime you feel suffocated, then you got to identify something's happening there. And then you may have to take deeper breath. So I think breathing is for me like technique number one. Um, and, uh, and also understanding that we have like three people inside of us. We have like the mind, the thinker, and the watcher. Yeah. So it's super simple. I have one of my clients who is an actress and she's trying to do a lot of things. And sometimes I feel like she can see uh, beyond the beautiful person that she is, she gets very uh, stressed out. Stressed out, like everybody gets stressed. But and then I tell her, imagine this. Imagine that you have uh, a play, right? The play is your life, what's happening every single day. Uh, and then you have the actress or the actor there. And then the script is there. And then there is a director. So you are kind of like the director. You can see the script and you can see the actress, but you don't identify to anything. You're like, you want the play to go well. You just want to mm -hmm. run. Yeah. You don't have to try to just let the actress play and feel the emotions, but don't attach to it, you know? Same with the script. It is what it is. It's happening there. So accept it, but don't get attached to it. So it takes time to like understand, like, am I attaching myself to the emotions and I'm not letting them go? Uh, so the universe can keep unfolding new chapters or like new plays and like are you giving yourself a commercial break <laughs> you know so I like, I like this that. type of analogy <laughs> that I usually give to my clients in yeah, all yeah. their um, all of their ways how they work because then they can understand oh it's true it makes sense you know I do the same thing with a chef you know like it's like cooking you know you have the ingredients on the on yeah. the meal and then you you have to just taste the food and just enjoy the flavors and don't, you know, if the food goes wrong, then make another one, you know, don't even get yeah. worried about it. So I think life could be easy as soon as you understand this. But I think if you can get the book of The Power of Now, that's <laughs> that one of help. the best. Yeah, it's yes. so easy. You don't need to read it all. Just read some pages. You're going to fall in love with it. I'm sure you're going to go for the whole book and tell everybody. There are many books out there. I think this one is a great book. There is another book called The Seat of the Soul. Mm. That one is a very good book as well. Gary Zukov, was it? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and then there are many. I mean, I would have so many. Uh, there is one that is called Many Masters, Many Life, The Messages of the Masters. That goes deeper into, like, past life and um, explaining so much about how we are. So I think the less attached you are to, like, and understand, oh, this 
person comes to me, it teaches me something, I'm just understanding, and then let it go. And if it comes nice, if it doesn't, I already in my next, um, you know, and the flow. So just be on the flow, breathe deeper, and enjoy it. That's it. Yes. I think the key is you have to realize that you're the director, not the actor. Yeah. And that's the, the main thing that once you figure that out, you kind of lose this, uh, lose the attachment to outcomes. Yeah, you just observe, yeah. you know, like in, in yeah. yoga, in yoga meditation, we say you are the observer or the witness um, of what's happening. But it, it kind of like the hardest part is like sometimes like oh, it's affects, it's affects, it's affecting me, you know, mm -hmm. but it affects you once you are attaching to the past or the press or the future, right? Mm -hmm. So I always say if you are in the present, then the past or the future, the past is just a memory. And okay. the future is just in, you imagining something that you want to achieve and want, mm. but it's not even happening. So why are you worrying about something that is not even happening? So just be in the present and the rest will flow. That's right. When, you, when you're connected to the present moment, you're flowing with the evolution of nature, consciousness, the universe. Totally, totally. And that's when you get those, the inner guidance. The inner totally. voice starts yeah. to talk to you. And people come to you and then you will yeah. be get surprised with so many alignments uh, in tune with the same uh, force of energy. Yes. So then life is just flowing, like swimming, You dancing. know when you're in the flow, right? When you're in the flow of life, it, it almost feels effortless. And yeah. I, I, I strongly believe, like I used to think my dad would tell me, you don't, you know, you don't get anything without hard work. You, yeah. have to, you have to get put in the sweat to get, to get the reward kind of realize that it's not really like that now. You don't yeah. have to work very hard. You shouldn't, there shouldn't be any suffering or struggle involved with whatever you're trying to achieve. Because when you're in the flow, yeah, everything sort of happens. Yeah, but then you're talking now about resistance, resistance, right? Because yeah. if you create resistance, then then you are going against the, the water. So if you just swim, you know, it's like playing the music and dancing. You're just dancing with the flow, dancing yeah. with the music, letting the things happen, how it's supposed to be. Um, eventually, uh, life will unfold that way. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say, obviously, you don't need to work hard to achieve things in life. But for me, what I classify as work now is, is not work because I, I love doing what I do. So it's no longer work. It's me yeah. doing what my heart's calling me to do. So totally, there's no resistance in what I do. So essentially, there's no struggle or effort. So that's what we're trying to say when living the present moment. You're connecting with your heart's calling. Which is totally. Yeah. Just well, flowing. you do it from your heart. Yeah. So then every action working is not working. It's just like doing something that you really yeah, love, exactly. and it happens that uh, you're getting paid for that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty how we we can get in tune. And every single um, career and profession in life is needed. So mm -hmm. it's great when you can get in tune to your profession because then then you're giving the possibility to the world to to really appreciate that. You know. So it's it's great. You become meaningful to others and you can contribute uh, in, in the in the world so yeah what advice would you have for someone who hasn't quite figured out what what their place in the world is yet they haven't really heard that inner voice just yet to know i don't really know what i want to do how yeah. does someone figure that out uh, that's a difficult process you know it's a very difficult process the person first has to come to me to ask me that you don't give advice to somebody that is not asking for an advice. Great point. Let's assume everyone listening to this podcast yeah. is ready for this advice. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think the first step is to be willing and to be curious mm. and ask. And that's what I know. So if they ask me, if they're asking me because you are curious, <laughs> then I could tell you to um, take a break from what you do. And even though you think, oh, but I need to make money, you know, yeah. like life is about making money. Like if I don't work, I can make money. Then, you know, if you can put your life one day away, let's say, if you want to really get into yourself, then it's going to be hard for you. It's going to, you're going to be running in a trap of like hamster. Mm. Uh, I would say, <laughs> um, I think one of the best things is to, to probably read a book, especially this book that we talk in the power of now, I think will be so, so useful. Um, I understand we have to pay bills and everything, but definitely uh, taking a break somehow, right? So taking a break, the book could give you a lot of uh, guidance if you're just taking a ride on the subway and it's an hour ride and you're just hating that you have to take this commute uh, so long, but at least that hour could be beneficial if you just take that hour to, to read the book that can, can start being like a teaser for your brain to understand that life can be easier if you just make the right, um, not the right, but if you can change certain things. 
So maybe just write down certain things that you want to improve and uh, the the per the people will come to you uh, to help you if you yeah. are willing to change all of a sudden you're going to get messengers and signs and angels that come mm -hmm. to your life to help you like there's always going to be somebody there 100%. open to help you so i think it, it starts from your own motivation to 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 improve and, and to to change and to ch shift your energy towards something that is more meaningful yeah exactly i mean if someone's already willing to ask those questions, I feel like that's your, it's already going to happen. It's already yeah, I, I believe on journaling, actually. Like, yeah, I would yeah. say read a book for sure, like these ones that we're recommending. There is so many others mm -hmm. that we can add. But uh, journaling, like, sometimes we have so many voices inside of ourselves. We have the actors, we have the script, yeah. we have the director. <laughs> all of a sudden comes the commercial and all these things. <laughs> like, what is this? So I definitely, if you can write down, get your journal, a paper, anything, write down your thoughts, you know, and if you have things like resentment or any type of hatred or negative emotion that you carry from the past and anything, uh, just write letters to people that they are there and you are just leaking these negative things towards others. Or um, I think journaling is important. So uh, there are a lot of techniques on how to journal. You can always have a little gratitude book, you know, of three things that you can thank life uh, and so you understand the life. We have also things mm -hmm. that we could uh, be grateful of. Um, and um, they are like fear letters that you just write fears that you feel and like what do you actually what is what is the fear coming from uh is it like a limitation um physical limitation it's just a mental limitation or like an old pattern that you've been following since you were a kid or maybe even your parents have the same pattern you just learn it from there so i think journaling will be one of the best techniques i have done myself i still do it um, i have my vision board that i see myself from now to Six months. I used to do it from now to a year. When it happened yeah. that I started accomplishing the things faster, so I now do a vision board of uh, six months from now. Well, I go depending on how I feel. Sometimes I spot myself in the middle, and I from the middle, it it, it comes or like uh, all the areas of my life that I want to improve, or I have a specific goals. So sometimes uh, I meditate and I get this like I want to make it like an spiral. A spiral. Spiral, yeah. Spiral, and the spiral will be like planets, like a cosmos. So it depends, you know. Yeah. Sometimes we have these crazy ideas, and I think um, uh, as long as it's yours and it's, it's, it's meaningful for you, and you're like connected to it, and and you have all these intentions uh, set up, you have we're set up dates, just like deadlines and certain things that keeps you aware that they are they are certain times that you need to accomplish things. So you have actions, right? So you don't get um, you don't you don't get overwhelmed mm. because you know it is possible. You just have to have action, do, do the actions to get there, and that probably will be a good way for you to to accomplish and to change what you are now and to to be where where you want to be. Yeah, I agree, Joe. And yeah, I agree with journaling. I'm a big journaler. Journal all the time. Mm -hmm. There's something about crystallizing your thoughts to paper that makes it all the more powerful. And yeah. Yeah, it certainly helps, especially goals and intentions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to be mindful of your time, Joel, because uh, it's getting late here. Yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> and before I ask the last question, uh, if people want to work with you online, where can they connect with you? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, people can find me on social media as uh, my name with fitness. So it's Joa Fitness. Uh, that's usually my Facebook, my Instagram. Uh, they can send me emails on Joa. J-O-A at joafitness.com, J-O-A fitness.com. And the website is there, it's joafitness.com. So everything is joafitness.com. Um, they can find me usually in Toronto now, and I'm planning to do some uh, retreats in other places. Uh, so far, it's going to be Victoria, most likely Mexico, and some other places. So for now, I'm putting all my intention, all my effort in Toronto. After three years, I'm super excited to put together projects and to meet uh, my old friends. So I'm having a great time now. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yes. So, Joa, people who are listening, they've come this far, they've listened to this whole podcast. What's one thing, or you can, I'll, I'll allow you to say two things. Yeah. That you want people to take action on. After listening to this podcast, if people want to get serious about change in their life, and, and really break through some the, the inner barriers that are holding them back. 
what are some things they can take action on straight away? Yeah, I think number one is if you would really have a balanced life, can you put in your and now like how much have you taken and how much have you given to the world? If you haven't given to the world, I think it's a good time to start giving to the world. So my second one will be to serve. I think there is a big um, hmm, like lack of awareness on that topic of serving. There is a lot of people saying, I'm meditating, I love meditation, I go to my yoga classes. But then there is not much of a service, you know. So I start serving others. There is a lot of uh, communities uh, created that are waiting for you to be part of. You can always take one hour volunteer for a cost that means something to you. Uh, you can create a foundation of fundraising that it will be important. If it's your birthday, everybody on their birthday, they want to have a big party, they want to drink, they want to get drunk, uh, they want to travel. But what about you and your next birthday, you make up fundraising and then you give whatever you uh, collect to a foundation, like let's say, of kids to create a program of education. Isn't it like the best way to celebrate life by serving life? I mean, so that's something that it took me years to understand that I was such a taker in my life. You know, I was taking, I took my body, I took from my parents, I just take and I keep taking. I'm breathing air that doesn't even is my air. And uh, then uh, I always try to think like, how much am I giving to the world? You know, so I think that's my biggest um, reflection for people to ask themselves, am I actually creating balance in my life between giving and taking? Beautiful, find balance, find a way to serve. It's a great, it's a great takeaway. It's a great question to ask each day. How can I serve today? It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can just be a little thing. But Correct. Yeah. Even with actions, you know, it doesn't have to be with money. A lot of people, like, they relate serving with money. Exactly. Like, just give me money. But actually, no, serving with your actions is very, very, it's, it goes beyond uh, money. Because exactly. it's just energy and so much and it, there's so many foundations out there i'm from venezuela i'm supporting a, a community f, uh, of kids between one to seven years in my country to uh, provide them food of like breakfast and lunch and to provide um, support to their teachers to be able to be there with them in my country there is a thousand five hundred kids uh, this is something that being started when i was 15 and it's now it's growing it's getting bigger uh, so I cannot ignore what's happening in my country. I cannot wait for the government to take actions. So if we all can think about little communities that need some help on any way from your actions to like financial support or creating, um, creating a bigger uh, events that involve other people, then this world would be way, way better than now. Yeah. 100% agree. Oh, thank you so much for joining me on the State Shifters podcast. It's been thank an absolute you. pleasure. Take care. All right. There we have it, guys. Another episode of the State Shifters podcast, Done and Dusted. Hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, and as always, please share this with a friend or family if you took something away from it. Um, and most importantly, leave some feedback, rating or review on iTunes. That really goes a long way for me. Uh, and be sure to subscribe to keep updated on when the latest op- episodes are coming out. You can subscribe in this page. Just throw your name and email in and I'll stay in touch. See you in the next episode.